You know the difference between people going to heaven and people not going to heaven? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. One of my favorite songs, amen? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. All right. Well, I want to go uh, through some interesting topics this morning. I've had something on my heart for a while, and I, was, I got to work this week. I was, uh, I was uh, working up on a roof, and I was listening through the book of Hebrews. And uh, there's a, there is a truth that I have, I have run across, but when I'm teaching exegetically, in other words, when I'm teaching word by word through the Scripture, book by book, um, some of these topics you come across, and it's hard to slow down and spend some time on the topic if you're going to keep the flow of what you're teaching because it's referenced, but it's not taught in the book. So uh, I've been doing a little bit of, of uh, in-between books here. I wanted to do some topical teaching. And this is one of those that I think is very important, and I haven't got a chance to teach it book by book. So I want to teach the nature of angels uh, topically. Before we do, uh, as, I, as I prepared this this week and labored over it, thought about it, considered it, prayed, read. It's so hard to get this into one message. And, and, but I, I persevered, I struggled, I fought and wrestled, and I failed. I couldn't get it into one message. And so uh, it's gonna, I'm going to have to do two parts to this. I really didn't want to, but it's just too big of a topic to get it into one, into one lesson. And um, and so I want to give you the overview this morning. I want to give you the beginning to the end of what we're going to look at so you kind of know where this uh, first message plugs into this thing. So the whole Bible, the, the story of the Bible from the beginning to the end is about a war over a kingdom. It's about a fight for a kingdom that is on this planet. And it starts a long time before God breathes into Adam that that breath of life into Adam's nostrils. The war started a long time before that, and it's going to carry on until the end of the millennial reign when God's ready to scrap this planet and create a new heaven and a new earth. And this battle we were created in the middle of. We came into this, this battlefront while this thing had already been going on, already started. And then you see us in the garden walking and talking with God, and Satan is right there ready to, to pull us onto his side, ready to, to, to try to snatch victory away. So what happened was Satan was created, and then he decided that he wanted to be like God. He wanted to ascend up unto heaven and be like the Most High, and the reason that he wanted to do that is he wanted control. He wanted to be the master of his own destiny. He wanted to be the one to call the shots. And so he convinced a third of the angels to go with him, and God cast them out of heaven. And when they did and they came down to earth, then God, some point later, made Adam and Eve and created them in the garden. And God gave Adam and Eve the thing that Satan wanted. He gave him autonomy. He gave him the ability to choose what to do with his own destiny. And God made Adam in charge of this planet. Well, Satan thought, here's a new way to come at this thing. Here's a new possibility. So Satan goes about with some de deception and some lies, and he tells Adam, eat of this fruit, and you'll have wisdom. You'll have the knowledge of good and evil. And what he did was he got Adam to leave God's kingdom and to join Satan's kingdom. He got him to, to leave the kingdom of light and join the kingdom of darkness. What happened when that took place is that the owner of this planet, mankind, had capitulated to Satan, which is why he's called the prince of this world, the prince of darkness. You see, he never owned the planet. We did, but we capitulated to him. For the next 5,000 years, it seems like Satan is winning. There's a battle back and forth between God and the devil, and, and the Israelites end up being right in the middle. They didn't start that way, but they end up right in the middle of this battle. And, and for a while, they'd follow God, and then they would, they would fall off, and they would fall into this other kingdom of Satan, and they would go back and forth. But practically, the entire world fell under the kingdom of Satan. And so then Christ comes into the scene, and suddenly Satan is no longer fighting God's angels. He's no longer fighting the, the kingdom of God as a remote thing. Suddenly, God is walking the planet. 
Not only that, God has taken on himself the form of a servant, a weak form, a form able to be tempted like as we are, uh, a form that had the same vulnerabilities that Adam had. So Satan pulls out all the stops. We read in, in Revelation that, that the dragon was there ready to consume the child as soon as it's born. That's what he wanted to do. So Christ grows and he, and he preaches. And again and again, Satan comes. We see it where Herod comes and tries to kill the kids. We see it when, when uh, the, the, the Pharisees are plotting to kill Christ. Again and again, they want to stop this kingdom of God, this, this movement of God on the planet. They fight against it. And, and then at some point, the unthinkable happens. If you're reading the story and, and you're going through it chronologically, something terrible takes place. Satan wins. I mean, from the very birth of Christ, his point was to kill the Savior, to kill Christ the King, the conqueror, and to stop him from usurping the, the authority that Satan had built over time and gotten people to obey him. And then it worked. He killed Jesus. And the Prince of Life died and passed into the realm of death. And Satan thought he had victory. But God, one of my favorite two words stuck together, but God, but God came and was born again when the stone rolled, I mean, was, was raised again when the stone rolled back. And when Jesus walked out, Satan realized he hadn't lost the battle. He lost the war. It was complete and total and absolute victory that God had over Satan that couldn't be any more victorious. He had destroyed death and sin and the power of death. He had separated it forever from mankind and brought freedom. You see, Satan was fighting for a planet. Satan was fighting for this kingdom, and Jesus was fighting for you. He was fighting to free you from the kingdom of darkness and to translate you to the kingdom of light. That was his point. Satan didn't even know the battle that he was in. And when he thought he won, ultimate victory was taken completely away from him. And we have victory in Jesus. That's what we're talking about when we sing the song, Victory in Jesus. We have victory in Jesus that is complete. It's finished. There is no more struggle. There is no more fight. Satan has lost if you're a child of God. You have been removed from his kingdom and placed in the kingdom of God, and there is nothing that Satan can do to you anymore. The Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. We have a promise in Ephesians that the gates of hell will not prevail against you. You know, Satan has the kingdoms in this world, and they are paper mache. You see those walls of Satan, you see those gates and those bars to stop you and to keep you out as a child of God, they are nothing but paper and paint to trick you into believing that you can't tread there, that you can't walk there, that you can't have victory there. But Jesus wrought victory, complete, total, and absolute victory. And we walk in that today. Now to understand that, you have to understand the nature of angels. You see, we give Satan way too much credit. We give him way too much authority, authority he doesn't have. And that's his power. His power is to deceive. It's to trick. It's not to fight and overcome. Satan cannot fight you. He cannot overcome you. He cannot best you in any field of battle because Christ has wrought the victory. It has nothing to do with you. You're resting in his rest, in his peace, in his victory. It doesn't have anything to do with you. So when Satan comes and he brings things into your path and your life and you stumble, that is you stumbling. That's not him making you stumble. That's not him twisting your mind. We're going to go through some, some and look at some things. Satan's not omnipotent. He's not everywhere at once. He's not all-knowing. He doesn't know what's in your heart and in your mind. He has to look at your actions to determine what you're thinking and what you're doing. Satan can't come in and make you choose something. God won't come in and make you choose something. Instead, the battle, again, is your choice. So Satan is going to put choices in front of you. And then you get to choose whether to follow him or whether to not follow him. Now, that's the overarching thing that I want us to see. I want us to see the victory that we have in Jesus. This isn't about angels. This is about you. 
But, 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 but for us to understand the victory you have in Christ, you need to understand the battle. You need to understand the war. You need to understand the characters that are fighting and, and the, the way that they're fighting. So let's go through some of this stuff. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the victory that we have in you. What an exciting thing it is to be a child of God and to be victorious with the great, great victory that you've wrought. Father, help us to walk with you, to worship you, and to walk closer with you and walk in the Spirit, Lord, and to overcome this world and all that's in it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Okay, the nature of angels. The first thing I want us to see is simple. Angels eat food. Uh, this speaker is, is on. If we can turn that monitor off. Angels eat food. Psalms chapter 78, verse 25, man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full, full. Isn't that weird? Angels eat food. They're physical beings. They need sustenance. They have Bible studies. 1 Peter 1.12, which things the angels desired to look into. He's talking about the prophets of old. Angels have Bible studies. They have a get-together. They eat some cornbread, and they study the Bible. You don't think about angels that way, do you? They have different expertise. Daniel 10.21, Gabriel says, I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. There is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. Gabriel says, I know the Bible better than any of the other angels. I've studied it longer. I've thought about it more. I know more about it, but anybody except Michael. He and I are kind of, you know, you know, neck and neck. He's being a little humble there. Angels have different expertise. They know different things. Some of them know things that the others don't know. They have ranks. They have, I don't know what their ranks are, uh, private. They have uh, uh, petty officers. They have majors. They have captains, generals. It says in Joshua 5, 14, he says, and he said, nay, but as captain of the Lord's host am I now come. Joshua gets into the new land, and, and he says, are you for us or against us? I think it's Michael probably. I think Michael's the captain of the host. He goes, buddy, I ain't for you or against you. I'm the captain of the Lord's host. So there's a captain. There's one that's in charge that gives orders to the other angels. They get trounced when they're fighting shepherds. Hosea 12, 4, it says, talking about Jacob fighting that angel. He says, yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. So an, uh, an angel that comes down in the physical plane wrestled Jacob until the break of day, and it took him withering Jacob's thigh. He, he did use some magic on him and messed up his leg so he couldn't walk right, but Jacob still held him down. He said, let me go. The sun's coming up. I need to leave. And Jacob said, not till you bless me. I'm not letting you go. So the angel blessed Jacob. So they fight physically, and I think this was on purpose, but, but they fight physically. We know that they like donkeys better than presumptuous prophets. Balaam's going along there. He's going to go curse the children of Israel. He's all just going along in his merry way. And three times the donkey smashes his foot, goes off the trail. Jake, uh, Balaam beats the poor donkey. And then finally he sees him, and the, 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 um, the angel says, And the ass saw me and turned from, thee, from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. The, don the, the angel's standing there, and he didn't want to be rude to the donkey. So he says, uh, just to let you know, donkey, I was going to kill that dude. You're going to be fine. You weren't doing anything wrong. I was going to kill, the, kill the, the prophet here, the presumptuous guy that was going to curse God's children. So, so we see that they, don't, they, 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 keep, they keep donkeys alive sometimes. We see that they use swords, Numbers twenty two thirty one. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hands. So angels of the Lord don't just point at somebody or something and, and say, poof, be gone. They actually have a sword. They have a sheath, a scabbard. They probably have armor. They pull that sword out, and they use it to cut people, to cut things, to cut devils at times. Is this an odd way to look at angels? Is this a little different than the thing with the little halo and the fluffy little wings that floats in a cloud and strums a, a little uh, a harp, throws spears at people? These, these things are men. They're strong men. They're bronze in color. They're taller than we are. They are good looking. They're handsome. It's enough to make the men of Sodom go nuts chasing these guys. They're, they're uh, desirable. They look at women 
and like the, what they see sometimes. They lust and have problems and fall doing that. You see, angels are created beings. They're finite, physical, created beings. That's what I want you to see here. That they're not just a, a spiritual force. Now, God has cr and creatures, hosts, that are spiritual force. We'll, we'll probably see it later. I don't remember if I put it in my notes or not. But he says you make your angels spirits and ministers in fire. And so God uses that at times. But the angels that we read about, the, the devils that fell, are physical beings that had their physical bodies destroyed. But in some realm, they're still physical enough you can chain those guys down. You can fasten them. And, and they move from one place to another, from one thing to another. They have individual desires and hopes. They're not all one thing. They're not all some, like, the negative side of the Holy Spirit that's everywhere at once and influencing everybody at once. They're, they're finite, physical, individual beings with individual hopes and dreams and ranks, and they obey certain ones are bigger than the others and, and more important and there is a, 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 a hierarchy to them. Luke chapter 2, verse 13, we see that they like to praise God together. They just announced the birth of Christ, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of, he of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The angels had been waiting for this moment for a long time. So as this angel speaking, there's a host behind him. I don't think it was just the, the angels that you would see, the mankind. There's probably all sorts of things we would call a, a type of a beast, like a seraphim or a cherubim. There's a host of heaven, and they're all singing. I think they were all singing there before, but nobody saw that until uh, uh, they recognized that until God opened their eyes to see it in the, wherever the angels are. So the question is, where does that leave us? If, if this is all, all in the Scripture, what difference does it make to understand this difference in the nature of angels? Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16. It talks about Christ. Paul is talking about Christ here and, here, and he says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but took on him the seed of Abraham. So we see that Christ didn't come with the nature of angels but with the seed of Abraham. He's contrasting the two. You see, angels were created higher than man. Angels can become invisible or visible at will or when God tells them to. They can make rocks catch on fire if God gives them the authority to do so and handle flaming swords, which I think is really cool. Angels can, can ascend and descend to heaven at the whim of God, and they have an appointed time. They say, okay, next, uh, next month on the 4th, we're going to all meet back in heaven. They have an appointed time that they meet, and they give a record of what they've been doing to God. But God didn't, didn't take on the nature of angels. He didn't take on a celestial body. Instead, he took upon him the seed of Abraham. He became one of us. He became a man. Hebrews 13.1, it says, Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Paul says, listen, there are times that you have seen somebody in need of a meal and invited them in, and then you find out, or you don't even find out, that guy was an angel. He just, God said, I want you to go down and pretend to be a bum and wait for them to come give you a meal and have that meal with them, talk with them, and here's where I want to encourage that brother or sister in Christ and you entertained an angel, and you didn't even know it. That's interesting, isn't it? Ephesians 6.12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we see that Christ took on the nature of angels. We see that angels are beings that we still might talk to and, and, and talk with today, but we see that we're not fighting flesh and blood. We're fighting principalities and powers. We're fighting against Satan's kingdom and his rule. We're fighting against spiritual wickedness in high places. High places are where you'd plant groves to devils. Uh, like the, uh, There's a grove over here close to the Walu Reservoir that's planted uh, to uh, uh, whatever false, false gods they have in, uh, 
in Hinduism. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10.4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty, through God, to the pulling down of strongholds. So we have a record here. Paul says, listen, the fight that we're engaged in, we're not fighting this with some weak and beggarly elements like the law. We're fighting this with the weapon of God, with our power that we get through God, and we can pull down those strongholds. Okay, I want to jump all the way back to the first instance that we have of angels, the very first time that we get to see angels in the Bible. Now, it's not the first time through... Uh, that it's, it's the first time through time that we see him, not, through, not in Genesis. So here we are in Job chapter 38, and God is bragging about the creation of the world to Job. And he says, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measure thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, therefore fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? So God says to Job, where were you when I laid the very first rock, when I stretched the foundations of the world out and I prepared this thing, the sons of God were singing and shouting for joy. This is before, I believe it's before the fall. It's before uh, Satan fell and we'll, we'll see why. I think that in a little bit. But here's, here's Lucifer and all of God's angels singing and shouting for joy as God lays down the foundation of the earth. They are excited about this new thing that God is going to do. And then it's and in Ezekiel 28, verse 12, we see that God writes a letter from Ezekiel. He has Ezekiel dictate a letter that he's going to write to Lucifer. He's going to tell Lucifer what he's done wrong and how he fell. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12, it says, Son of man, take up lamentations upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, the reason he says Tyrus is because at this time Satan is indwelling the king of Tyre. And we'll see that clearly in a few minutes what he's talking about. Just like when he wrote to the king of, or the, talked about the prince of Persia. Back in Daniel, he was talking about the, the devils that were there in Persia. So he says, I want you to take up and write this letter, and I want you to say, when, when you were here, you filled up. You, were, you filled the, 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 the measure totally full of wisdom and beauty. You were as beautiful as it's possible for me to make, make a creature. And you were as wise as was possible. You, you filled it up. 28.13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, the, uh, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. So he says to, to, this, to the, Lucifer, he says, When I made you, you were full of these precious stones. They were, they were part of you. That's why your beauty was beyond compare. Not just that, you had pipes in you that, that could sing in harmony, in four-part harmony, I suppose, to, to yourself. You could make this beautiful resonant noise that would, that would just reflect the glory of God because you were going to be the covering cherub. And he says you had tabrets in you. So can you imagine this beautiful cherub that God created? He's got four wings, the face of a calf. He's so impressive. He sings and this, this resonant sound comes out and he's sparkling as jewels and he's shaking and the tabrets, the, ta the, the tambourine is like is rattling with the rhythm as he's singing. What an amazing creature God made. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in the ways, in thy ways from the day thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. That word perfect again is complete. He says to Lucifer, there you were lacking nothing. You had everything you needed. I didn't create you with deficiencies. I created you perfectly. You were the perfect creation with with beauty and wisdom, and you got to walk in my presence and in the, in, the, in the midst of the stones of fire and reflect the glory of God 
until iniquity was found in you. Ezekiel 28, 16, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. So God says, you were filled with merchandise. So they were, they were selling. Lucifer was buying and selling something on Eden. Remember, he says you were in Eden, the garden of God. So at, at some point, Lucifer is, is on Eden, not the garden of Eden. That's, that's the garden that's eastward in Eden, but the entire in Eden. And so Lucifer's there, and he's buying and selling stuff. And, and then he says, you filled the midst of you with violence. There was some sort of violence that went on, some sort of fighting that we're not told about because it's not important to our walk with God. But there was a violence among the, uh, among the angels that were there. Remember when, when uh, Jesus is speaking in John chapter 8, verse 44, he says, You are the father of the devil, and the lust of your fathers ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So in Ezekiel, we see that there's violence in the midst, and Christ says, you're a murderer from the beginning. So at some point on Eden, as Lucifer is this beautiful creature, he's walking around, he's got merchandise of some sort, the angels are buying and selling. Isn't that a strange thing about the nature of angels? And, and he murdered somebody, another, another angel, another creature. He was a murderer from the beginning. Continuing on, Ezekiel 28, 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before the kings that they may behold thee. So he says, because you were so beautiful, you became corrupted. Because you were such an incredible creature, you became corrupted and you decided that you were going to be like God. So he says, because of thy brightness, that same brightness is used in Job. It's talk, talking about his glory, his, his, uh, uh, who, how wonderful he was. So because of his brightness, the, all of him together, the glory that he had, he says, you fell and because of that fall, I'm going to cast you to the ground before the kings. Thou hast defiled the Filed thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. He says, because of what you were buying and selling, because of your traffic, that you, uh, you were filled with sin. You had a bunch of iniquity. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a fire inside of you, and through, through emulsion in flame, I'm going to burn you up to ash. That's when Satan's body was destroyed. I'm going to cast you back to earth, and, and you're, going to, you're going to be living in ignominy in the front of everybody that thought you were awesome. Now, often the Bible moves through a character like this, and it'll talk about him from the beginning to the end. And it skips a bunch of the places in between. So the ultimate destruction of Lucifer is talked about a little later on in this passage. But we're going we're gonna to move over to Isaiah 14 where it continues, where Isaiah has something that's written to Lucifer. And this is, this is one of the couple of the only places that we see in the scripture that we have record of the fall of Satan. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. So Lucifer, we, we see here what was in his mind. He's there trafficking. He's there with merchandise of some sort. And he s says, does some, something of violence, some sort of fight. And then he says, I'm going to go up and I'm going to be like the Most High. I'm going to ascend unto the Mount of the North. We see that in, in Psalms 48, uh, talking about Zion, that it's on the sides of the north. Isaiah 14, 14 says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So he's talking about leaving the planet and going up to heaven and being like Christ. That was his point. That was what he wanted, was to be like Christ, like God. Revelation 12, 7 talks about the war in heaven, and it takes place 
uh, throughout this whole period of time. And it talks about the final casting out of Satan out of heaven. Revelation 12, 7, and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So when Lucifer is trafficking on earth, he, he decides to ascend and be like the Most High. He gets to heaven. There's a war in heaven. God doesn't just boof and make Satan's whole army disappear. There is a war, and Michael and his angels cast out the devil, and a third of the angels get cast out with him. Uh, 12, 4, Revelation 12, 4, And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. That's the prophecy of Christ coming. And that Lucifer or Satan would stand there ready to devour him as soon as he was born. Is this a little wild? It's a little different, isn't it? It's a little bit odd way to consider Satan and to think about him not as a all-powerful spiritual force of negativity. That's the way we think about him. But to think about him as a guy an angel, a created being who got uppity, went and challenged God, got slapped down hard, lost his body, got cast to the earth, and is ticked off and wants his kingdom back. Wants some power and authority, an individual, a, a singular thing at a singular place. So then Satan gets to expand his kingdom. Now, I want to go through this a little slower because this is the way that he expands his kingdom in us today. This is, the, this is his... This is his design on us. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any of any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So Lucifer, okay, it doesn't say this is Satan. It says that there is a serpent. But when we get to Revelation, he's called that old serpent, the devil. So I'm comfortable that Satan is indwelling a serpent here in the garden. And, and as this serpent has legs at this point, it crawls around. And we would call it a big lizard or a dragon. And so Satan indwells this thing in the garden. And it's a beautiful creature, which is why he does it. He's still arrogant. And he goes to the woman and he questions what God says. He asks him some poignant questions. And, and then he lays out the advantages to ignoring God. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil." So Satan says to her, no, God's not, doesn't mean that. Instead, he says, try this, and God knows you are going to be more than you are now. You're going to have some knowledge that you don't have. Now, not all of this is a lie. As a matter of fact, most of it's not a lie. Some of it is a lying or stretching the truth, but Satan's power is in deception, not in forcing. He didn't come to Eve and say, click, click, click. Oh, I'm going to eat that. Instead, he came and said, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Let me present this possibility to you and then tell you why it's advan the advantage is to you if you'll do this thing. You see the difference in the way he's tempting her. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and, the tree, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave it also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Adam and Eve moved from the kingdom of light to the kingdom of dark by choosing to disobey God. It wasn't about the fruit. It was about the disobedience. And by moving from the kingdom of light to the kingdom of darkness, they were able to understand the difference between darkness and light. Because they were in the sight of darkness, they could look back and say, that's different than where I am. 
Where I am is bad and that's good. Now I can see the difference. When you're in a field and all you see is good all the way around you, it's hard to understand the bad. But if they had chosen to not eat of that fruit and instead to be obedient to God, they would have seen the dark from the light. They would have seen the kingdom of Satan and its lies from the kingdom of God and its safety. But they didn't. They chose to capitulate and become part of the kingdom of Satan. John chapter 1, verse, verse, uh, John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. You know, these three things are the temptations that Satan likes to bring. They're the exact same temptations that, that he brought to Eve. He says it's good for food, lust of the flesh, pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, desire to make one wise, the pride of life. Lucifer doesn't come down and make you fight with your wife. He doesn't do that. He doesn't come down and twist your heart so that you become angry and yell at your wife. He doesn't come down and trick you and twist your eyes and make you desire to look at pornography. Lucifer doesn't do that. He doesn't have the power to do that. He's a finite creature, not just a force of darkness. He's a thing, a creation, a weak and beggarly thing, a thing that has no authority and no power over you and in your life, something that his power is to trick you. Now, there are plenty of people. As a matter of fact, most people are part of his kingdom. Most people are part of what he's doing in his program and his plan. And most people walk with him, and he has the power over them. He has the power to twist and to possess and to direct and to whisper and to move them to do evil things and to grow his kingdom of darkness, his kingdom of evil. But you know where he likes to hang out? Churches. He likes to hang out in churches. He likes religion. You know, in the book of Revelation, when we see the devil, he's depicted as Babylon, mystery Babylon, this religion, this world religion that's, that's passed through generations, that's still where he's hanging out. He's hanging out in Rome, looking over shoulders, whispering in ears, getting things done. Why do you think there's so much darkness, so much despicable things that take place inside different churches or synagogues or places because the devil likes religion? Why? Because the whole thing's about his authority. This whole thing is about his power. That's his design. He doesn't care if you lust or not, except that it makes you weak, makes you inept at the kingdom of God. But that's not his point. His point is his own authority. It's his own kingdom. It's his own power. And so Satan doesn't make you lust. The Bible says that we sin when? When we're drawn away of our own lust. Our own lust. You know, your flesh wants stuff. It just does. My flesh wants coffee. It likes coffee. I, I enjoy a cup of coffee. I have decaf coffee in my coffee maker at home. That's irritating sometimes. I want leaded coffee. You know, I, I want the good stuff. My flesh likes it. it yeah, and your flesh likes food, and it likes, it likes stimulation. It likes pornography. Your flesh likes all kinds of things. That's not Satan. That is the meat you're walking around in. That's your body. The Bible says, walk not after what? Satan? No, walk not after the flesh, but walk after the spirit. You know, Satan doesn't need to come down and make you yell at your wife because she offends your pride of life. That is my right and not yours. And how dare you tell me to pick up that piece of trash that I put there? I went to work. You have to pick up the trash. And now it's on for three days. Satan didn't make you do that. Your flesh did because she talked down to you about picking up your garbage and therefore the pride of life gets involved and boom, it's on. Satan doesn't make you click on that website. Your flesh wants to be stimulated, wants desire, wants to enjoy and release happy chemicals in your brain. And so you go along and you say, yeah, but you know what it does do? You know what the Satan can do? Satan can talk to those people that are part of his kingdom to produce that thing that you like. He can work in a society and change laws so that it's legal to do that kind of garbage. He's in people's lives and in their hearts to help them and push them and direct them 
to kidnap people and, and to take pictures of those people and to put that online so that you'll enjoy those pictures. And you'll become a weak and beggarly and, and, and wicked person so that you have, you have no, uh, uh, you get nothing done in the kingdom of God. That's how Satan's working. But you know, God has overcome that. God has destroyed his work in your life. God has completely wiped out Satan's ability to influence you beyond what your flesh and you walk by your choice. That's what the cross did. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now, he's talking about, about two things, and if you read the chapter, you can, you'll follow through. But he, first of all, he says, you were dead, and physically, you were, you were, the sentence of death was passed on you. When Adam sinned, he died, and his whole race died. It's appointed in a man once to die, and after this, the judgment. When you, when you were born, a sentence of death was on you because of your relationship to Adam and the sin that he committed. So he says, you have the quickened. He has made you alive, your, your body. The death that was passed on you, that's removed. And now you have life everlasting. According to God, you know what you're doing? You are seated on the right hand of the throne of God. You've been, you've been born again. Your old things have passed away. All things have become new, and you're seated up there with Him. You are alive in Him. You've been quickened. And you were dead, but you're not anymore. Because of your sins, you were dead. Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world. That's following Satan's kingdom. The course of this world is the kingdom of darkness. He says, before this took place in you, before I born you again, you walked according to the course of this world. You walked the way that, that, that the world walks according to the prince of the power of the air. He had power over you. He had authority in your life. That the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's, that's what's in them. Those people, there were 39 children that were rescued in Georgia this week. They went in and they were, they were in, some of them were sold as sex slaves in Georgia. And these U.S. Marshals went and rescued those kids. Others had been kidnapped for other and various reasons. That sort of evil that takes place in the world that's part of the course of this world. And he says, you walked that way one time, but you don't walk that way anymore. Among whom, this is the people that are walking through the course of the world, among whom also we had our conversations in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. He's talking about that, that uh, judgment that was on us. He said, there was a time that you walked just like they did. You had the same conversation of your life just like they did. But I came along and I changed all that. There was a time that you were under the wrath of God. The natural inclination, the natural order of events is the soul that sinneth, it must die. And that judgment was passed on you. You were going to die. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. But he said, I came along and I paid for that. And, and death is now swallowed up in victory. And you're no longer one of the, the children that are under the wrath of God. You're now part of the children of God, the kingdom of light the kingdom of life. So what is he doing? What is Satan doing? If he doesn't if he's not this ultimate force for evil that makes everybody do bad stuff. If he's not if he's not like this the, the evil spirit that's everywhere, what is he doing? What's his plan? Revelation 12:10. It says, "And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of our Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Friends, this is coming. This is going to happen. The devil now has access to heaven, and he can go up there still now and accuse you before God. He can go up and say, you know what Don did this week? You know what he thought about this week? You know where he, what he said? You know, do you know what Nathan did? You know what he said or thought or went? Or, and, and he can bring accusation, railing accusation. But there's coming a time when God says, you're done. 
I'm sick of it. I'm tired of hearing it. I'm going to get my kids. Get out. And he's cast down to the world, and it's done. It's over. But us, verse 11 is us. But we overcame him. How do we overcome him? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. You know what testimony that is? That's not, well, I was, you know, 19, I was a drug addict, I got saved. That's not the testimony he's talking about. It's my testimony, it's your testimony, it's every testimony, it's your testimony if you're a child of God, that you were sinner and lost in sin and a child of wrath and that you were translated to the kingdom of his dear son by the blood of Jesus Christ and by the work that he finished on the cross at his resurrection. That's your testimony, the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's what he's done for you. And so he says, you overcame him. How? By, your, by jimmying up the courage to fight back with say no. You overcame him by the testimony. I'm a child of Jesus Christ, and you have no authority in my life. Get the hint, Satan. I'm not part of your kingdom. I'm outside of your echelon of power. Job chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came also among them. So the word angel is messenger, right? It's, it's, it's God's messenger to us, but they are the sons of God. We call them all angels, but, but an angel is just somebody that's bringing that message or working for what God is doing. So when the sons of God present themselves before the Lord, there was a particular day that they were going to do it, and they came, and they, they, they stand, I imagine, in rank, right? There's a captain. The captain of the guard is standing at attention, before the throne of God, and he's looking down at the angels. They all stand there. The swords are all straight, and they're, they're ready to, to speak to, 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 to God about what they've been doing. And here comes this slithering serpent back and forth among them, comes before the throne, and God looks down into Satan, and he says, The Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So here's the angels, they're presenting themselves to God, the sons of God, and the Lord looks over and here's Satan up in heaven, and he goes, what you been up to? And he says, I've been traveling around the world. You know, Satan has to travel. He has to move from one spot to the other. He says, I've been all around, and God says, and the Lord said to Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? And thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land? Put, but put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. You know, this is a weird story. This is strange. Satan presents himself with the sons of God when the sons of God comes, and the Lord has a conversation with Satan. And he asks him some stuff, and Satan says, I can't touch Job, that's why he worships you. And the Lord says, okay, have at it. You know, God is not bothered by what Satan is doing, that Satan is functioning for you and I, that this whole war, this whole drama that's played out is there for the purpose that God would redeem to himself a peculiar people that would have faith in him, that would trust him, that would be to him a people and he would be to them a God and they would choose him. That's what this whole thing is about. It's about us choosing Him. You know, God didn't need to make us weak. God made us lower than the angels. He didn't need to make us that way. He could have made us with all sorts of knowledge and information and known things that we don't know, but He didn't. He made us weak so that we could trust Him, so that in our weakness He could build us up. Romans chapter 8, verse 33, it says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? You know, the accuser of the brethren is there before the throne now. He's there even as we speak back and forth, accusing us. 
of all that we've done, all that we've allowed to take place, all that we've capitulated to in our lives, and, and the weak and, and just pathetic ambassadors that we often are. And, and the fact that we walk after the flesh so much, Satan is there to tell, oh yeah, he did this and he did that. But he's not alone. Jesus, the Prince of Life, the Prince of Peace, the everlasting Father standing before the throne and He is saying, no, that's my Son. No, I redeemed Him. No, He's part of my kingdom. No, I'll take care of that. And He's praying for you before the Father. And He is praying over you and over your life. You know, I cannot stress enough that Satan has no authority in your life. He just doesn't. He has no power. Christ has overcome Satan at the cross. He took the keys to death and hell, and it's done. It's finished. It's complete. I want to leave you with a, a quick story that, that just kept reminding me of this. In the Second World War, we were about to go uh, and to uh, attack um, France. We were about to land at, at Omaha Beach and Utah Beach and so on. And, and as we are going and we're about to, to, to take on those Germans, we weren't strong enough to do it. They had all these battles, uh, battlements, these concrete bunkers and stuff all the way across there, and they had a lot of tanks. Their tanks were better than ours. They were faster. Their guys were well-trained, better trained than many of ours. And their equipment worked, uh, was superior. Th something along the lines of their tank was worth 10 of ours, and we just couldn't beat them. So you know what we did to beat them? We took inner tubes, Goodyear, made blow-up tanks, inflatable jeeps, inflatable airplanes, and we took them way south and in, in, across the English Channel, and we made a whole army of blow-up dolls. And, and then we sent Patton down there to march around, and when, I almost said Lucifer, <laughs> when Hitler found out that we had this big army and Patton was down there with him, he knew we were going to attack, so he sent his brigades, his big tanks, he sent them down there so that he could fight against this inflatable army. You know, the inflatable army couldn't do anything to, to Hitler. He couldn't attack any tanks or knock down any walls or do anything, but he got them off guard. We were able to trick Hitler and to get him off guard and to get him to move his forces and to, and to re, reposition ready to fight our rubber army. And then we came with uh, the coolest, baddest soldiers in the world, the U.S. Marines and the U.S. Army, and we took his positions because we fooled him. You know, Satan's got a blow-up army. He's got a bunch of blow-up dolls to trick you and to get you to believe that he has power in your life that he doesn't have, to convince you that you are weak and incapable and broken and unable to come against his kingdom because of all the problems in your life. And let me tell you, you've got problems. You've got, you've got terrible problems. You've got sin issues in your life. You know, we all do. We've all got sin issues in our life. And you know, the, if we say we don't, then we're lying about it. We're, we're, we're just, you're just fibbing. You've got problems, and guess what? God's going to use you anyway. God wants to use you this week anyway. God wants to use you as a mighty soldier for Him because of what He's done in you, not because of what you've done in you. Don't let Satan rob you and trick you into saying, I've got to be this, this person, this thing, this, this awesome army before I can do anything. Instead, say, God, man, you're awesome. Look what you've done to me. What have you got for me this week? What can I do for you today, Lord? Direct me. The weakness in your life, the struggles, the difficulties, the things that have happened, they haven't broken you. God wants to use those in you. He wants to use those for His strength. I'm not saying that we say, grace will cover it, run out and sin. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying grace has covered it, run out and serve God. And don't sit there in, in just misery thinking, ah, oh, I've been defeated because the battle's been won. It's finished. It's over. It's complete. And it doesn't have anything to do with you. You can't get defeated because you weren't in the fight. You weren't even born yet. The fight was finished. You can't be defeated. 
because God is the one that's brought victory. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Oh, Father, thank you for making me a child of God, for making me one with you and for coming into me with your spirit and for, for working in my life through the weakness, through the sin and the difficulties and the problems. And Father, thank you for redeeming me and for us, Lord, for what you've done for us. Lord, we come before you and say you are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our work and our labor, labor over the word and sowing that word among, among the nations. Father, help us to be instant in prayer. Uh, Lord, uh, not to be defeated in a victory that you've already brought, Father. Thank you for this word. I pray that you would just make it uh, so in our lives, make it real. Lord, thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.